crying uncle generally indicates defeat, but sometimes it's a cry for help that's answered with love. My Uncle Dave and I have always had a really, really special relationship. If someone needs your help, you help them. I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't. That's kidney transplant recipient Anna Shabelman and her living donor uncle, David Shabelman. I'm Monica Fox, kidney transplant recipient and Director of Outreach and Government Relations for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. On this episode of The Journey Continues, Anna and David share their special bond and journey as recipient and living donor. Hi, Anna. Hi, how are you? Great, how are you? Hi, David. Hi, Monica. Thanks for joining me and um, your willingness to share your journey with me today. Anna, I'm going to start with you. How'd your kidney disease journey start? I was in sixth grade and I started to have some kind of strange symptoms. I wasn't feeling super well. I went to the doctor, I got some blood work done, and that kind of showed that I first had evidence of kidney disease. Wow. So you were about 11 years old and you learned that you had kidney disease. How'd you feel when you heard that diagnosis? Were you afraid? Yeah, I was. It was definitely a scary thing. I had been sick. I kept getting sick that year. So it was nice to have some sort of answer, I think, to what was going on. But yeah, it was definitely a scary thing. Oh, that's interesting. So the diagnosis kind of gave you a little bit of comfort, at least in knowing what was going on and why you were getting so sick. Yeah, exactly. But once you heard that you had kidney disease, did you have any additional fears or expectations about that? Yeah, I feel like I really didn't know much about it. When I was in sixth grade and I was first diagnosed, it was very, like the very beginning of a diagnosis. I didn't really know very much. It wasn't until some more years later that it kind of progressed to become much worse. So you didn't know anything about it in the beginning. How did you learn more about kidney disease? Um, I definitely did my research. I looked up a lot of information. Um, I found things out from my doctors, but since it didn't really have that big of an effect for, you know, a couple of years until it progressed and became worse, it didn't really affect my day-to-day life until a little bit later. And when did it begin to affect your day-to-day life? Um, so I was first diagnosed with kidney disease when I was in sixth grade. I was about 11 or 12. Um, and then when I was a sophomore in high school um, was when my kidney disease really began to progress and become much more severe. And as it progressed and you, the doctors talked to you and your parents, did they talk to you about dialysis or transplant at that time? I knew that eventually that would be something that would need to happen. But until I went into kidney failure, it wasn't something we talked about as being a real possibility. So then were you 15 when you started dialysis? Yeah, so I was 15 when I went into acute kidney failure. And then in the February of 2017 was when I began dialysis. And how was that transition for you as a teenager? You were in high school at a very prime time in your life. How was that transition to dialysis? Yeah, I was really hard, especially like in the time of my life when I feel like a lot of my friends were becoming super independent and that kind of thing. And I just had to totally changed my entire lifestyle. I really didn't have control over a lot of things that was ha- that were happening. So it was definitely really hard to be a high schooler and going through all this when, you know, it wasn't something that anybody else was going through. And did you do dialysis at home or in a center? Um, so I began by doing hemodialysis um, in a center for about six months. And then I switched over to peritoneal dialysis, which I did at home overnight for about six months too. When did you learn about transplant and what was that process like of getting on the transplant list for you? So I have also, um, besides kidney disease, I also have an undiagnosed autoimmune disease. And so all of my doctors were really hesitant to jump right to transplant just because of all the different components. And obviously they wanted to make sure that you know, there was nothing that could endanger a new kidney. So it took about a year between when I went on dialysis before we really started talking about transplant, just because 
there were all these different protocols that needed to be taken. I ended up in like their search to make sure that I was ready to receive a transplant. They found nodules on my lungs. So that was another component that, you know, they had to make sure that that was clear and safe before they could move forward with transplant. So yeah, it was about a year of dialysis before um, we really started to talk about the possibility of getting a transplant. And when you began that process of transplant evaluation, what was the conversation like amongst your family regarding living donation? Both of my parents have different blood types than me, um, which is a requirement for donating an organ. So they were both out of the question. So then we sort of looked in our family who had the same blood type as me and my uncle Dave, he's my dad's older brother, um, had the same blood type as me. So He was actually the first person that got tested to see if he was a match. That was very lucky. Did you think you'd get a living donor? Did you think that the process would happen that quickly and easily? I never thought it would be quick or anything just because in my experience with everything medically I've had to deal with, nothing's quick, nothing's easy, especially with so many different um, moving parts and especially because My treatment was done at pediatric facilities. So when um, my uncle got tested um, to see if he was a match, he was going through the adult side of the medical world. So there was a lot of communication that had to be done, just like a lot of steps that needed to be taken. But my uncle Dave was the first person to get tested. And they had kind of told us that it's a lot of people when they're looking for living donors have to have many people tested to see if they'll be matched. So I don't really know. I wasn't necessarily like super confident that it would happen so quickly and everything would just sort of come together, I think, in the way that it ended up happening. Yes, I understand exactly what you mean. And when I said it would happen quickly and easily, that's exactly what I was referring to is the fact that your first donor that came forward to get tested was the donor that worked out for you. And that's not often the case with uh, many people. So that was really lucky and really fortunate situation for you. And I'm really happy to hear that. So how's being a transplant recipient affected your life as a teenager? That's really when a lot of people experience their first kind of freedom. But instead, it was very much like my world was kind of overtaken by everything medically, um, which was definitely really hard. Um, So in that year um, of dialysis, that was probably the hardest it was. And then it did end up happening like fairly quickly when I got approved for transplant. Again, too, like I was saying, nothing's easy, nothing's quick in the medical world. But I was really expecting to then have to wait a long time before the surgery was scheduled. But I really think if my memory is right, too, and maybe Dave can back me up, but I think it was almost within a month that I got approved for transplant and then the date was set. I remember finding out in March and then my transplant date was April 9th. So it ended up coming together really quickly. The transplant process, I think, too, for some people, when they receive that transplant, it's like the world of difference um, because they've been so sick. For me, I was actually doing really well on peritoneal dialysis. I had kind of gotten into a better routine. I had been just like feeling more, I'd been feeling better in general. So then the transplant was definitely a really hard, almost setback in a way for me because the recovery process for my transplant was really, really hard and really, really painful. So I got my transplant April 9th and I really don't think I felt great until the end of April. But once that end of April hit, it was like I was such a new person. I felt so good. I could live my life so much more normally, like, you know, a normal 17 year old would. Also, I had mentioned like I have a lot of other autoimmune issues too. Um, But after my transplant, my health completely transformed. I have been so much healthier from that point. So now I'm about two and a half years out from the transplant, I was able to go to college in a different state. I've been able to just live so much more of a normal life post-transplant, which has been really incredible. Wow, life-changing. That is incredible. 
I am so happy to hear that. What college do you go to? Um, I go to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Go Badgers. Yes, go Badgers. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn my attention to your hero, David. Please tell me about yourself. Oh, about myself. Well, I don't consider myself a hero, first of all. Well, Anna and I... Oh, geez. Let's see. I always get emotional about these things. It's totally an emotional situation. And I understand that you don't consider yourself a hero, but you are a hero. You saved her life. You changed her life. And now she is in college and she might change the world. So, David, you were you working when you decided to do this? And you are you married? I work as a substitute teacher. So it actually works out really well because I can choose my own schedule as a as a substitute. So when this all happened, it was it was easy for me. I actually live in Oregon, but um, I came back to Illinois. It worked out pretty easy in that respect, in that I um, I didn't have to quit a job or lose my job or anything like that. So, are you married? Do you have children of your own? Uh, I am married, and that's actually a good story, too, because I met my wife because uh, she was actually babysitting Anna when she was probably one or two. She was a babysitter, and I was actually working uh, from their home, from Anna's home, and uh, met my wife that way. So Anna kind of brought me and uh, and my wife Jill together. Oh, this story just gets better and better. <laughs> This is great. This is great. I know. <laughs> so how'd you feel when you learned of Anna's kidney diagnosis day? Oh, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. And so why'd you decide to become a living donor? I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't. <laughs> if someone needs your help, you help them. That's beautiful. That's simple and beautiful. Thanks. Did anybody at all question your decision to be Anna's donor? Well, I mean, we definitely talked about it and there was a lot of discussion, but yeah, I, I, I um, there was never really, <laughs> uh, yeah, I never gave it much thought to not do it. There was no question. No question. Wow. So what was the testing process like for you? There's a lot of testing and it actually kind of worked out. I found that I actually had to have my gallbladder taken out. So that happened. And then when I knew that I was going to do the kidney transplant, it, it took me about a month to get over my gallbladder being taken out. And so I, I was kind of like, well, it's probably going to take me about a month to recuperate from the kidney, um, from my kidney being taken out. So anyone can do something in a month. Like it, a month goes by so fast that, you know, even though it's a long process and it, it's a painful process, it's just a month. And, you know, anyone can do that. I remember too, because when all the testing was happening, that meant that my uncle Dave and Aunt Jill were going to come to Chicago to stay with us for it, which like I was so excited about. <laughs> so... <laughs> regardless of what was going to happen after that. I was just excited they were coming to town. We were going to be able to see them too. So that was a bonus, huh? <laughs> so tell me, David, about your recovery and your return to regular life. It is a month and I had to have a lot of support from my wife, just even stuff like, you know, getting out of bed and that kind of thing. But I think we kind of figured it out from the um, gallbladder thing where we did this thing with a, a sheet in bed where you kind of twirl it around like a rope and it helps pull you up. So uh, we kind of figured some stuff out from uh, from having previous uh, surgeries. Um, so, yeah, it, it took, I mean, it took a while, but, you know, you, you had um, you had milestones like I could go for a walk around down the block and then I can. Uh, you know, go for a walk for a mile, and then I can go for a hike. So, you know, it, it's it's a process, but it's not a debilitating one. That's good to hear. Have you had any problems after giving your kidney to Anna, either financially or otherwise? 
Any problems at all? Uh, I have not. The hospital where where we did the surgery, they they're really good, and they um, you know we have uh, follow up appointments. I think they started at six months, and now maybe we, I just do them every year. Or, but um, they've been really good about that. And even with me being in Oregon, um, we still I get tested on some blood work and things here, and uh, they communicate with my doctors back in Chicago. So that's been pretty easy. And uh, I would say there's no difference in my lifestyle now. Um, I think I'm probably supposed to have less salt, uh, salty snacks, but um, other than that, I can't think of anything that's uh, that it's held me back on. That's great to hear. That's just wonderful. Are there any misconceptions about being a living donor that you you might like to clear up for people? I don't want to like minimize um, what uh, what they do and taking an organ out of you, but it is something that's fairly easy to get over with. You just have to give it a little bit of time. So um, I think if you have a chance, you uh, you definitely should do it. I agree. I agree, Anna. How do you use your kidney diagnosis and the journey that you've been through as a vehicle for advocacy and educating others around you? I think that I've definitely um, become much more of an advocate for organ donation and um, living donation, too. I feel like there is almost a misconception that all transplants come from deceased donors, Um But I think when you hear about the amount of living donors that exist and the amount of living transplants that happen, um, it's really incredible. And um, again, not to minimize, like what Uncle Dave said, not to minimize anything that you go through when you donate um, an organ, but um, just being able to save somebody's life through a surgery that, you know, then afterwards you'll be able to still live a normal life. I just think it's such a powerful thing. And just being able to be an advocate for organ donation and especially as a teenager, I feel like I'm able to speak out about like how much it really can change somebody's life too. And that brings me to my next question. What do you, what do you want other teenagers to know who are dealing with kidney disease? Um, I think that dealing with kidney disease, at least for me as a teenager was like, was really isolating. I feel like it's kidney disease isn't, something that's super prevalent, um, especially among young people, especially among teenagers. So having to go through that experience, it really did feel isolating at times, even though I know that there are other people who have gone through it and are going through it. But just to be able to say that on the other side of my transplant, I've been able to live such a normal, healthy life that I really didn't even know was super possible until after my transplant and now it's sort of like just this one thing about me that happened that I can talk about it's by no means like the only thing that I'm going through the only thing that you know sort of defined who I am which I think is a really powerful thing just like that on the other side there is this really healthy normal life that can happen that is truly powerful you. you are amazing. David is amazing. Yes. David is a hero, whether he wants to admit it or not. Most heroes don't like to own up to it. You don't have to wear a cape, David. You really don't. But I just want to thank you both for spending this time with me, for sharing your very special journey. Your journey is truly special, and I really appreciate this time and this conversation. For Anna and David, their family bond grew even stronger when he donated his kidney. While relatives are a great place to start, when looking for a kidney, donors and recipients don't have to be related. Your perfect match could be anyone. For suggestions on how to start the conversation, visit nkfi.org. At NKFI, prevention is a major part of our mission. That's why at the end of each episode, you will hear a nutrition tip. Here's Dr. Melissa Prest. Here's today's nutrition tip about meal planning and prepping. If you're looking for ways to increase your success with diet changes, then look no further to how you are meal planning and prepping. 
Done well, you will find that you are saving money on groceries, time, and allowing you to reach your health goals. Here are some tips to help you master meal planning and prepping. Start small and plan out a few meals and snacks. You'll find what works well for you and what doesn't, and then you can build by adding in more meals and snacks to your plan. Think of making a healthy plate with a protein choice, a carb choice, and fruits and vegetables for your meals and snacks. Get your kitchen and pantry organized so you can see what you already have on hand and what you need to buy. Plus, you can quickly find things that you need when you have an organized kitchen. You can also shop your pantry first when putting together your meal plan. Make sure you have some good food storage containers to keep your prepared meals and snacks. Keep a few variety of herbs and spices on hand to help you create tasty meals. Schedule your meal plan time and your meal prep time so that you are sure to have time to do both. Always head to the grocery store with a list and do not shop when hungry. This helps keep you on a budget, on task, and limits those impulse purchases. Batch cook and freeze. You could batch cook food like pasta, rice, or barley and use it for a variety of dishes during the week. The same with vegetables. They can be cooked or chopped and can be spread out among many meals. You can also freeze some of the meals that you create and save it for another week. Prep your fruits and vegetables when you get home from the grocery store. This will save you time when you need to use them for recipes. And make a plan for leftovers and when you will use them in your meal plan. With today's nutrition tip, I'm Melissa Prest, a registered dietitian nutritionist and the foundation dietitian for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. The Journey Continues is brought to you by the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois and sponsored by Donate Life Illinois. To learn more about kidney disease and living donation, visit www.nkfi.org. To register to become an eye, tissue, and organ donor, visit lifegoeson.com. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please subscribe to and leave a review for The Journey Continues in Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. This podcast is produced by Rivet. To hear more great podcasts, visit rivet360.com.